Everybody ready? There we go. Well, when they first walk up the stairs, I think they're as nervous as I was the first time I walked up here. You didn't know what to expect, what this was going to look like. We didn't know if it was a lab. We didn't know nothing because it's a breast cancer foundation. Well, you walk in and it's home. Maureen's there, welcome you at the door, and it's home. There's a couch, there's a table. So we're all like, wow, all of a sudden your guard goes down and you're welcomed into this environment and it's very comforting. Oh, I was so scared the first time. I really was because I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> I was afraid to share or meet people. And when I when I first walked up those stairs and Maureen greeted me, I was I was a tough one for her and I thought, okay. But then it was warm. It was home. You know, it kind of hugged you. And I went, oh my God, it threw me right off balance. and. I ended up sitting, which I told her 10 minutes, and now I'm here forever. <laughs> well, I guess after we painted the RV and, and named it the Hope Bus, um, I, I think it came from my childhood. Uh, we, the nose art that we had on the models uh, in, in most of the fighter planes that we had, uh, they were always named after um, the pilot's wife or daughter or something like that for inspiration. And I thought uh, th this would be a great thing um, Gloria Gemma, you know, is the namesake of the foundation, and, and, and right now she's uh, guiding us on every trip that we take in the Hope Bus. So, uh, very significant for us. Uh, I, I usually do a ritual of uh, going out uh, before I leave and drive the bus and just do a little, little piece of gratitude for Gloria Gemma. And if you want to take a look on the other side, now the bus really was a, a gift from the Hulkyard Family Foundation. When Bob Hulkyard approached us and, and, um, and we discussed the funding of the Hope Bus, uh, one of the things that, that really solidified it was the fact that Joan Hulkyard was an educator. Education is a big part of what we do on the Hope Bus and uh, it's only fitting that the co-pilot should be Joan Hulkyard. I wanted, no, I wanted to give back. I had done it and I felt like I would be good at giving, giving it, sharing it with people, just listening to people or talking to people that are going through the journey. And it, it's, it's an amazing experience. It's been for me, I get way more out of it than I give. The people that you interact with, they're so appreciative. And I think most people, when they come on the bus, they're not sure it's new, it, they, they don't know quite what to do. For me, the worst thing about cancer is the fear of cancer, or the fear of breast cancer. I can't speak for other cancers, but the, the worst thing is the fear. When the foundation opened the Resource and Wellness Center in 2008, um, we uncovered this tremendous need in the community for this one-on-one -on -one intimacy and conversation. So what started out in the small 600 square foot space on Mineral Spring Avenue became very crowded. And we also realized that we were getting people from certain areas, but we were stuck and not getting people from other areas. And it was really always our desire to embrace everyone. Rhode Islanders don't like to travel long distances. So, you know, we weren't getting um, everybody that we wanted to get in the state to come to North Providence. Rhode Islanders don't like to travel. Hence, we didn't get everybody to Mineral Spring Avenue. So we, we came up with the idea of developing this bus to bring it out into the community and really go to the people, go to the people and bring service to, services to that community that that community needed. We thought about should we have you know, a physical location in each one of the five counties, um, but what we came up with, which I think is a you know, great idea, was the, was the hope bus that we could go around and, and, and first test the waters and, and, and check out whether, uh, uh, whether Rhode Island was ready for us in all, in, in all five counties, and they are, so it's a success. Even though it's a small state, um, it is pretty big 
considering people don't drive more than 15 minutes. So, um, and just the fact that they can give out our information and then later on um, have somebody call me and say that, oh, I got your flyer and your phone number from the Hope Bus. You know, and that the fact that I can actually be able to help them. I hate the word triple negative. I, I hate it because people will say to you, what kind of cancer did you have? And I had the triple negative. And they look at you and they go, ooh, because you, sometimes you don't make it. A lot of times you don't make a triple negative. I was offered a study. I did the study. It was very hard. It was barbaric. I had more tests, more mug scans, more needle biopsies where there was nothing even left to do needle biopsies. But it was something I read, I did. The side effects were horrible. I just had my gallbladder out because the chemo killed my gallbladder. It just is barbaric, the whole journey. So triple negative, if it gets in your lymph nodes or anything other than stage three and up is usually, you know, not good. Not good. When she got diagnosed and, and the, the worst day was when uh, she was going to be operated on and they screwed up and before they operate on you, they put mar little markers, little chips inside to, to locate for the operation and uh, they lost some paperwork and missed a clip. So we had to have a quick meeting before her surgery and she was originally going to have a uh, lumpectomy and we ended up having a mastectomy in what, 10 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes to decide. It was terrible. Sometimes they'll take the lymph nodes when they do biopsies to removing all of the breast tissue. And when I say all, remember when I said you check all the way up here, they remove it all. I started um, cancer outreach in 1999 when I was invited to join the staff of the Rhode Island Cancer Council. And the Cancer Council ended up being something other than was originally planned. Um, we, as soon as we went live with the public, we started to get questions about free mammograms. Where can I get a colonoscopy? I have no insurance. I can't afford to pay for my drugs. Um, and then as we paid more attention to statistics, we realized there was a need for education. And so my experience um, comes out of the Cancer Council, um, designing education programs, as a matter of fact. The um, Pink Spirit program, which we do in high schools, which is an education program we designed there, um, was actually my first entree to the Gloria Gemma Foundation. Because when we went out for the first few classes at the first few schools, we realized there was something missing. And we decided we needed to find breast cancer survivors. And so we reached out, the foundation had just started and we reached out to the foundation to ask if they had access to breast cancer survivors who could come to the schools and share their personal experiences. And so as the Cancer Council budget dwindled, um, we knew that we would be going part-time. Uh, we thought we were closing, and so I had reached out to Maria Gemma, our executive director, to ask if I could volunteer. Um, for them and while I job hunted and less than a week later I received a phone call and met with Maria and Gary Calvino who is our director of development and they offered me the position of community outreach coordinator specifically for what we now call the Hope Bus. Well back in 1990 Congress passed the Breast and Cervical Cancer Mortality, Mortality Prevention Act and what that did was that authorized CDC to, was to create a breast and cervical cancer screening program nationally for women that are uninsured, low income, 
um, minority women. And what happened was is that program started probably a few years later. We all had like funding capacity to start up. And then Women's Cancer Screening in Rhode Island, and that's what the name is in Rhode Island. Every state has a different name. There are 50 states in the program, plus the District of Columbia, five territories, and 11 tribal programs. So in Rhode Island, it's the Women's Cancer Screening Program, and it's housed at the Department of Health. And we have an information line there um, for all women that want to call and ask questions about the program and referrals. We invite representatives from the state's Women's Cancer Screening Program which is operated out of the Department of Health. And probably of all the people and organizations we work with, they are our biggest partner. Most women that come into the program, even though we target uninsured and low income, it's basically uh, more and more we're providing services to the working poor, which are the middle class, don't have insurance, recently divorced, recently unemployed, um, calling the department needing help. That program provides free mammograms, as well as other cancer testing doctor's visits and subsequent testing. To date, and that's been since 1997, we've enrolled over 34,000 women in Rhode Island uh, into the Women's Cancer Screening Program. But women come through, probably five to 6,000 women a year come through the services in the program. Well, I think it's such an attention getter when you look at the Hope Bus into the community, into these different areas where they would never probably see something like that come in and park bright pink and just you know a welcome door a welcome sign that says come in um, I think when people from the community and you know they see this it's it's just that thing that says to them you know it's a peak of curiosity it also helps them to to see an opportunity to to know something new you know something that they've never known before if women don't have insurance and they're 40 years old the state has a program for free mammograms. I started seeing a lot of different things about the foundation and I thought, you know, I need, I need to find out more about this agency. And it was actually a call from uh, Gary Calvino or Maria, and I forgot who it was, and we got together. And what I realized in that brief conversation with Maria and Gary is that they have the same passion and commitment, you know, that the women cancer screening staff have at the department, you know, Maria and Linnea. Um, and what we found was that we treat every woman as an individual who deserves respect, and every woman is different. Today we're doing art. Um, we're decorating rocks um, with messages of hope um, for our garden at our event in October. So you're welcome to do that today you want to. We don't have anybody who's written any message in Spanish. That would be a nice thing to do. And also answer questions if people have questions about breast cancer. Okay, we belong to the um, Ocean State Harley Owners Group and we belong to the Hog Chapter and they were doing their charity run and they were doing it for Gloria Gemma. I, I met Maria and Gary at a meeting I think it was in March because I had my mastectomy in February. So it was March. And everybody says, oh, you got to meet, you know, Maria and Gary. you got to meet Maria and Gary. And at this point, I was like, well, this is nice, breast cancer, you know, la, la, la. I was going through the mo mo the motions, you know. I, I was, really don't want to meet anybody. I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want to meet nobody. I'm just here. <laughs> and I met Maria, and she started talking to me. I did this in my mother's name, and... I have to tell you, I, I was a little impressed with Maria. It was sincere that I heard in her voice and in her eyes. And then she said, you have to meet Maureen, the Hope Bus, the Hope Bus, the Hope Bus. And I'm thinking, oh, what are they trying to do to me here, you know? I'm trying to, you know, just crawl in my little hole. And, and then I gave Maureen a hard time and went on the Hope Bus. I fell in love with Maureen. She was sincere. And I saw her talk to people that came on with questions and all her, all her knowledge. And, and I just sat there and I said, my God, this is a for real thing. So I started going on the Hope Bus. I like the small. I like the intimate. I like the one-on-one. -on -one. I get to hear people's stories. They actually, they get to help me. You know, it's a give and, give and take. It's, it's such a healing process because you really feel 
that you're the only one when you're going through it. You sit in a room with a bunch of people getting chemo and everybody's saying what's going wrong, what's not working, how they're feeling, and but then you go home. That's the only time you really get to talk to other patients and that's that's a crappy room. You know, and, you're all hooked up to machines. And, and you can't talk to anybody because everybody's in their own little cubby hole. You know, everybody's like separated, you know. One of the main things that when you walk into the hospital or, or walk into a doctor's office, it's a very sterile environment. You have the white floors, the white walls, the, the paper over the, the tables and everything. And what we really wanted it to be was people could come in, could sit and relax, sit on a couch or sit on the armchair and just be at home, not, not feel like they're, they're in that kind of area with a big spotlight on them. It, it's just kind of sitting back and relaxing. This was family members. This was husbands and wife and kids. And it was like, holy cow, everybody's touched by this. So it gave me strength and hope. So of course, me being nosy and stuff, I had to go check it out, find out what the big deal was. So. We went to an event and everybody was there and stuff. And then, of course, uh, I, I uh, opened my mouth and volunteered. Said, hey, if you, if you need an extra driver or something, I can drive the bus for you on weekends when I'm not working. It was a new experience, obviously. Uh, the, the, the first thing that I noticed is that the people that come on the bus feel very comfortable. and it, It's kind of like a safe zone for them where they can tell their stories and, and get uh, help and, and we have all sorts of pamphlets on board and stuff for uh, people who don't have insurance and stuff like that. I don't know where Barry actually fit in through the whole breast cancer journey to be honest with you because you're so focused on surviving and making sure everything's all right everything's all right that you really do forget about your partner. You know they're there they they're there to help they're there to take you for your rides there Barry has never been somebody who is emotional with words or whatever, but when he's sitting there, that's 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 huge, all right? Or if he's volunteering, that's huge. You have your family and stuff, but us guys, we don't sit around and talk and do that kind of stuff like women do, you know? Um, and that's where the whole bus came in. Uh, I mean, it was very consoling and, and um, she just loves it. It's like, it's like a home away from home. And when we're out in the community, we, we, we try to keep the Hope Bus like that. So people feel very comfortable getting on. So it ended up being, he would drive the Hope Bus. Now he sits in his seat, Maureen sits in her seat. I sit on the floor in the middle of us. We all have a coffee. And before we get to the event, we're talking about the event. And we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And we're going to get everything ready. And you never know who's going to walk up those stairs. And he was getting into it. And then he saw men coming on and kids coming on. And he didn't have to hold in his emotions. And I would catch him outside talking to somebody. It's called giving back. Um, she went through her journey, which was horrible. And um, anything that we can do to help others with their journey or, or any of their needs, emotional, physical, information, anything, it's, uh, it's kind of rewarding, actually. <laughs> started in about 2010. They started coming down here as just a group and we had meetings at night and it, we really had a hard time getting the whole thing rolling. Well now we've gotten to the point where we're almost too big for the bus. As she said there was nothing down here for women um, and it doesn't have to be breast cancer to be any kind of cancer. Everyone is welcome. We welcome everyone. So there was just nothing here and now we've got such a tight community of women. It's wonderful. It, it truly is not all about the numbers. Every person is important. And it's one person at a time. It's helping one person at a time. And I know that the Hope Bus does that in the community. We were at an East Bay Head Start Family Day. And Brian Sawyer pointed out a woman who was standing outside and said he had invited her onto the bus, but she wouldn't come on. So I joked with him and said, well, Brian, no woman my age wants to talk to a guy your age about her breasts, trust me. So he left and I invited her and she still would not come on the bus, but 
Somehow she was compelled to just stand outside and watch what was happening. And her daughter, who was a teacher, forced her onto the bus and said, my mother is a 17-year breast cancer survivor. And as I congratulated her, she started to cry. And she told me her story, that her children were in high school. She has two daughters. She was a single mom. Her, the father wasn't a part of their lives. Daughters were 15 and 17. And so if they thought she had cancer, she was afraid that their world would come apart. So the only people who knew she had breast cancer were her boss, because she needed time off, and the medical staff that took care of her. And she had walked this journey by herself. And when she got up to leave, she asked if she could hug me. And I said, of course, that's one of the signature things on the bus. You always get a hug. And she whispered in my ear for the first time in 17 years, this, you have allowed me to let my breast cancer go. And I can now move forward with my life. And even still, it touches me. And that was three years ago. But she never left. And the thought that this boss, this foundation, can have that impact on someone just takes my breath away. I've seen, and certainly Maureen has shared many stories of the youngest of children to the oldest of people, and men and women. And, and we've certainly gone through a lot of Kleenex boxes on the Hope Bus with a lot of tears being shed, you know, during that during those conversations. So the Hope Bus has made a tremendous impact, I believe, in the community and allowing people to share their stories. You know, Gloria Gemma is all about collaboration. We can't do it alone. We're seven employees right now, and, you know, we started, um, you know, five years ago with, with myself as the first employee. Um, we can't do it with seven, so uh, collaboration is really important. So we've been able to really, uh, I mean, organizations like Thunder Mist and Woonsocket, we wouldn't be able to, to penetrate the you know, Woonsocket market without the YWCA, the, you know, in, in, in Woonsocket, the, the th Thunder Mist. Uh, we do that in, in, in every one of the areas, and we collaborate um, um, to the best of our ability. Uh, because a lot of these, you know, um, we are not a medical facility. Um, so to be able to pull someone from a doc or, or you know, or a, a, a nurse or, 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 you know, someone like that, uh, you, you know, some of the breast health navigators, come right on the bus with us. Women's Cancer Screening Program is a good example. Women's Cancer Screening Program is a state program. Their workers can come right on the bus. It's a good outreach. It's a way in which, you know, so that's a great collaboration. And when we're, we're looking at businesses, we're looking at businesses, I call it the, you know, kind of the businesses that get it, you know, that little twinkle eye. And we can see that. A good example is CVS. I mean, we just got a CVS grant this year. And, and, and you know, in, in the conversations with CVS, it wasn't just getting a grant from them. It was sitting down with them. It was how can we, how can we reach you? How can we reach your employees? How can we work with you? When CVS Caremark is thinking about partnering with organizations, the goal is really to get to the people. It's really to find those opportunities and pockets of people that really don't have access to health care. When we think about building healthier communities, it's really reaching the access and making sure that people have what they need to take care of themselves. Wellness and prevention, critical part of a long-term health care strategy. So when we think about what we want Gloria Gemma to be successful in the longer term, is really to make sure that everybody knows what they need to know and gets the help that they need. Now, everybody wants the bus. Um, we receive requests by email, by phone, um, sometimes by text, and we coordinate. We try to find out, first of all, in coordinating it, who the population is. Um, we try to focus on low-income um, neighborhoods and organizations, but that doesn't preclude us bringing it to a business. So several years ago, I was having conversations with my parents about family history and some of the factors that we needed to think about. My mom had had a serious heart attack a few years before that. And in the conversation about parents and grandparents and things we need to know about, my fa father actually casually mentioned that his mom had passed away from breast cancer. And I looked at him incredulously saying that that's an important fact that we should have known. And he didn't think of it as an important fact. He's 85 years old and a long life of of, of him and his brothers and sisters. It just didn't seem like he 
thought it was as big of a deal as it potentially could have been now that we know all the things that we know about wellness and prevention. You know, having the conversation with my father was awkward at first, um, but once we started talking about it and he opened up, it was a, an amazing source of knowledge for me. This is sort of the point of the bus, is to have these conversations that can be uncomfortable, but really trying to ask the right questions. It's a small community, but a large community in the sense that if one out of six women today are gonna be diagnosed with breast cancer in our state, we need to do a lot more outreach. I do remember getting on the bike for the first time and, and I was petrified. I was not feeling myself, but I needed to get out and live. I needed to get out and, and do stuff. I wasn't ready to give up on my family. I just didn't know how to deal with what was, what was happening. But the fact that, come on, we'll go for a little ride. Yeah, I wanted to be with him. And that's our way of getting back out in the world. And he would take me to the zoo. And he would take me to see the ducks down in Mystic and all the little things that I love to do. And that's when it started. I started coming out of that little hole saying, I'm alive. I... I can be happy again. You know, I don't have to be sick all the time. I don't have to be afraid to go out. Or, you know, society gives you this. You have to be perfect and a model and you got to be happy with yourself. And yeah, you got to love yourself. But when you're all cut up and refigured and stitched up and you look at yourself for the first time in that mirror and you're like, oh my God, you're thinking everybody out there is saying the same thing. So baby steps to get out there and you're like, nobody cares if you got one or not, you know, just go out there and live your life. And maybe I can help somebody with that. You know, nobody sees that part of you. Only you do. My bucket list. Oh God. One is to pet an elephant or kiss it anyways. Honest to God, it, it's a, that's a true statement. I love the animals. I love the zoo. I love the animals. Um, I want to go to Washington. I want to see the White House. I want to go to Grand Canyon with Barry. I want to take a ride on Route 66. There are just some things. San Diego Zoo. There's a few things I would like to do before I die now. There's these little things I really need to do. In a heartbeat, it's gone. You just keep going through the motions. You're working, paying the bills, working, paying the bills. All right, the kids are growing up. You're doing this, you're doing that. You didn't stop and breathe. Now you're hit, sitting on the couch, don't know if you're going to take your next breath. Whoa. I'm so thankful to see tomorrow. So yeah, you got a bucket list.